humans have such amazing brains, why do we get stuck in traffic jams, don't have enough to eat, and mess up the planet? Seems to me humans are actually pretty stupid. That's because we no longer grow our brains properly. Why? Because the way we raise children these days is at odds with the way we've evolved to learn. Like what, Grandad? Well, our brains naturally prefer big picture learning, understanding how everything fits together. Instead, we specialise on separate bits, not the connections. It all starts in schools with the separate subjects we take. We hardly ever fit all the ideas together. Wasn't it always like that? Oh, no. Up to 300 years ago, our ancestors grew up in small communities or family farms. They always saw how things connected and learned on the job as apprentices. Our brains love that kind of learning. What went wrong? The Industrial Revolution. Over three or four generations, everything changed. Most of our ancestors were forced out of their communities and into the new mills and factories. No more big picture learning. Instead, we've been trained to focus on one particular bit, repeated over and over again. Why on earth did that happen? Well, in the 1890s, an American, Frederick Winslow Taylor, had an idea that literally changed the world. He realised that while machines made us more productive, the people working them were relatively slow. So, by timing people's activity, he created what's called the scientific management of work. Instead of taking pride and responsibility in how they did their jobs, everyone was told exactly what to do by experts. Who in their right minds would agree to that? No one would give up their freedom for such mindless jobs. You're right. And so Winslow Taylor offered workers a deal. He said, do, do it, it my, my way, way, by my standards, standards at the, the speed, speed I say, say and, and you'll achieve an amazing, amazing level of productivity. Of productivity. I'll, I'll pay, pay you handsomely, handsomely for it, beyond, beyond anything, anything you might have imagined. imagined. All, All you have, have to do is take orders and give up your way of doing your job for mine. But that's just awful. No wonder we're so bored. Yes, but his methods caught on around the world and they lifted millions out of poverty. He helped us to become as wealthy as we are now. But it came at a terrible price. Folktales are to be believed, the devil seems to have quite the interest in music. Whether it's the satanic imagery that's ever pervasive in metal, or the legendary fiddle duel in The Devil Went Down to Georgia, it would appear that the Prince of Darkness likes a good tune as much as you and I. But there's one tale of the devil in music that captivates like no other, and it's one that's been told for centuries. The deal with the devil. Nearly everyone knows this kind of story now, and that's because it has a rich history dating back several centuries. Let's take a closer look. Deals with the devil have appeared in Western mythology for a long time, but they really first started catching on in the late 1500s thanks to a man named Johann Faust. Faust was a German alchemist and magician who was alleged to have made a pact with the demon Mephistopheles in return for his soul. His talent became famous after being documented in Christopher Marlowe's play The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus. A hundred years later, the myth first made its way into music thanks to Giuseppe Tartini. In 1713, the devil appeared to Tartini in a dream, and Tartini made a pact for his soul. In the dream, he gave the devil a violin, and the devil performed the most beautiful sonata he had ever heard. Immediately upon waking up, Tartini tried to write down what he heard and created the Violin Sonata in G, better known as the Devil's Trill Sonata. 
Despite the success of this piece, Tartini wrote that his effort was so inferior to what I had heard that if I could have subsisted on other means, I would have broken my violin and abandoned music forever. It would seem that the devil's interest in violin didn't wane, as rumors of another violinist cohorting with the devil came about a century later. Niccolo Paganini is considered by some to be the greatest violin virtuoso ever to have lived. He started music at the age of 5 on the mandolin, was composing by the age of 7 and performing live at 12. And he was such a virtuoso that the public began to surmise that his talents must have come from dark dealings. On top of his skills, Paganini had a pale, lanky look with long fingers and flaming eyes. The legends of his performances are something else to behold. Some reports say audiences made the sign of the cross as they watched him perform to protect themselves from evil. Other stories have him continuing to play flawless notes on broken strings and contorting his body into weird shapes while performing. One fan even left a Vienna concert, claiming he had seen the devil aiding Paganini. At the age of 54, Paganini died, and one of the last things he did before he died was send away a priest who had come to perform last rites. This cemented his association with the devil in many people's minds. Less than a hundred years later, legends of the devil meddling in musical affairs started once more. In the 1920s and 30s, a pair of blues musicians in the Mississippi Delta are alleged to have run-ins with the devil. First came Tommy Johnson, a guitar virtuoso known for his eerie yodeling. Johnson's brother Liddell spread the legend of Tommy's Faustian bargain. One night, the story goes, Tommy Johnson went to the crossroads just before midnight and played guitar until a big black man came up to him, took his guitar, and tuned it. After that, Tommy Johnson could play the guitar like no man alive. Outside of the alleged deal with the devil and his influence on blues music, Johnson's life was rather uneventful though. That can't be said for Robert Johnson, unrelated to Tommy, another musician who apparently made a Faustian bargain. Johnson was one of the most impressive guitar players of his time and one of the most important musicians of all time. And when he was a young man in the late 1920s, he started to play guitar, but apparently he had no talent for it. Fellow blues man Son House famously remembered how Johnson played the guitar. Such a racket you never heard. It'd make the people mad, you know. They'd come out and say, why don't y'all go in and get that guitar away from that boy? He's running people crazy with it. I'd come back in and I'd scold him about it. Then one day Robert Johnson left Robinsonville where he had been living. When he came back, he was a changed man. Johnson returned with incredible guitar skills, sliding around the neck seamlessly while maintaining steady rhythms. Legend has it when Keith Richards first heard Johnson play, he thought it was two guitar players. Rumors started to grow that, like Tommy Johnson before him, Robert had sold his soul to the devil at midnight at a crossroads. And if you listen to Robert Johnson's music, it's easy to believe it too. Atop his virtuoso play, Johnson's lyrics have a haunting desperation to them, and he even sings of his relationship with the devil. Hellhound on My Trail is a masterful song that takes the trope of the rambling blues man and puts a new spin on it. The reason Johnson is a traveling, wandering vagabond is because he's got hellhounds following him. You could even look at this song as the middle of a trilogy of songs chronicling his run-in with the devil. Crossroad Blues is where he sells his soul, and then the trilogy ends with Me and the Devil Blues, which came from Robert Johnson's soul. Johnson was poisoned by a jealous husband and died at just 27 years old. Since Robert Johnson, the devil has continued his relationship with music, but no Faustian bargains like that of Paganini or Robert Johnson have been struck, at least not that we know of. Though it's been nearly a century since Johnson, so maybe it's time for the devil to dip his toes back into the music game. Oh.